think uh, we're good to get started now. So, uh, again, uh, welcome to our latest Wednesday webinar. Thank you all for taking time to join us today. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, app dynamics and how it can drive your application visibility and brand loyalty. Uh, my name is Adam Bonney. I'm the CTO here at Natilic, and today we have a guest speaker, Greg Ostrowski, who's kindly joined us from App Dynamics. Uh, Greg is the regional CTO for the Americas. Um, I will uh, get out of the way and allow Greg to do the, <laughs> do the good uh, thing. Thank you, Adam. My deck prepared. Thank you, Adam, and 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 thank you for inviting me to to speak on the the Wednesday webinar today. It's fantastic. I'm really happy to be here and, and chat with everybody. So you know to kind of set the stage here. So um, like I mentioned, Greg Ostrowski, regional CTO here. Um, to set the stage, you know, when you look at the overall application space and digital services, you know, folks have become so dependent on the applications that they use from a day to day basis. We recently put out a study called the error of the digital reflex and it talks about how folks are now in a position where they, they just use their applications as a reflex. They go in and they, they check things on a daily basis. And, and you know, even like when, you, when people are waking up, the first thing they do is they check their phone. I know from, from my end, you know, the first thing I do is I log in, grab my phone, log in to check my email, check my, my messages that came through. I log into my bank. I mean, I, you know, you, you now have the ability to log into your bank multiple times a day, but not necessarily because you have to, but just because you can. And that's the expectation levels. And, you know, you just use these digital services on a regular basis. You know, I, I don't know what your what's your day like, Adam? Are you, you starting out in that same way? Yeah, I think most of us probably start out that way now. Right. And, you know, throwing in I wake up and ask sort of, you know, I'm a digital assistant, Google or Alexa um, to sort of give me my morning routine get the weather, you know, what's on my schedule that day, all kinds of stuff, pulling together a whole load of information that's, you don't even think about it, do you? You just do it these days. Yeah, you just you just become so dependent on it. And just like, you know, everything you do today is is so dependent on your applications. You know, you, when you travel, you use your, your phone to, as a boarding pass, you get it, you know, nobody really gets a, a cab anymore. You're using things like Uber and Lyft, and it's just so dependent on it. And when you look at some of the statistics, you know, out of the consumers that have been using the applications, 84% of them are experiencing problems with their digital services over the last year. So that's, that's almost, uh, you know, 84%. That's, that's a substantial number. 76% say their expectations for application performance are rising. So what that means is, you know, now that you're, you become so dependent on it that when they fail, you know, it becomes a, ch a, a real emotional challenge to you. So your expectation levels are that they're always going to be there for you whenever you want to use them. And the other thing too, is that the development of the applications have to be done in a way that they're so intuitive that you can easily pick it up and use the application. So the expectation levels have definitely been increasing. And lastly, when you think about the consumers using your app, and I always like to say that the application is your business or the application is effectively the front door of your business now. And when consumers are starting to um, have a negative experience, they're starting to, to promote negativity about your application or your company. So when you see 63% that are starting to discourage others from using your digital services, that, that's really detrimental to your business overall. When you think about the, you know, the, 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 the current situation that we're in, you know, with COVID-19, the pandemic hitting globally, I mean, it effectively turned the world upside down with, with a lot of priorities and a lot of challenges that we had, you know, everybody had to move to a, a remote working capability. The IT departments are now supporting their consumers to make sure that that digital experience is even better than before. So when you think about it, IT has been under, under um, such amount of demand during this period of time to be able to keep the business functioning. And when you look at it, the brands really must focus on the digital performance. Just today, uh, we, we launched a, a new report around the agents of transformation where we pulled the, the um, 1,000 IT leaders globally to find out what's some of the biggest challenges. And 81% of them are saying that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been the biggest technology pressure that they've ever seen in their careers. 95% 90, of the organizations that they're being polled are saying how the digital experience has now become a very high priority. You know, when you look organizationally, when you talk about digital transformation, a lot of that is, is not necessarily just technology, but you also have a cultural shift. So COVID-19 also introduced um, a rapid, de rapid demand for some of these digital transformation efforts. And you're starting to see things where faster approvals are going through, faster implementations are going through. 
you know, these technologists out there supporting it are about two thirds of them are saying that they are being asked to do functions that they've never done before. So you see that there's a, a, a big demand on, on technologists, but there's also, it's also at a, at a point where IT is in such demand to be able to keep the business relevant that it's, it's, um, it's really unprecedented in today's time. I mean, I, I don't know what you've seen in your, your side of the, the um, equation there, Adam, but uh, maybe you can add some color there too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I suspect this is a global thing, not just a UK thing, but um, we've specifically seen here that, you know, online grocery stores, uh, they've really struggled to keep up and uh, they've really struggled for their apps to deliver the service. Um, in a lot of cases, they've, I think they've frankly been lucky um, in so much as there isn't that much choice out there for people. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but in a lot of cases, I think other organizations would have would have taken a real pounding for the performance that, that we've seen from some of those services. Yeah, for sure. So in today's, uh, you know, today's climate, we, we refer to this as we're in the, the fourth paradigm shift. You know, if you kind of roll back the clock, and I always like doing a little walk down memory lane here. If you look about, uh, you know, back in the, the 60s and 70s, the mainframe was like the big powerhouse of computing. So you have things crunching large numbers and banks dependent on mainframes and insurance companies, all these groups that were very dependent on the, the processing power of the mainframe, then evolved to client server. So instead of having all your processing done at one location, you're having it distributed around to all your PCs and, and built, built out the client server model. Moving forward, uh, you came out to web. Now, I remember when uh, back in the, the 90s, to show my gray beard, I made a little bit of age on me, you had web, you know, websites started to come out and, and I always kind of made a joke where everybody knew they needed a website, but they didn't really know why. So they started building out these websites that were very informational, you know, just something to put something up, get your company out there, show, show what you're about. But then they evolved and you started to see websites become very transactional and that's how you started to conduct business. You know, it's just like I said before, from a personal level, you started to use the early versions of online banking to pay your bills, you know, uh, check into your flights, all these different things started to happen where websites became so dependent on how the business functioned and, and operated. But then you started to run into the issues of scale and how do I start to take on this massive explosion of the, you know, the, the, the whole era of there's an app for that where you, you start having applications for pretty much everything. And that's where cloud and microservices really started to ramp up. So cloud and microservices is, is a fourth paradigm shift what this really enables is folks to be able to develop and roll out new features at a much faster pace and also enable you to scale as things happen that are that are outside of your control so COVID-19 is a great example of, of something that happened overnight that automatically required folks to scale up their services focus on that that digital transformation projects and deliver that really top-notch consumer experience when you look at that, right, so you look at how this evolved over the last decade, you know, 10 years ago, we had a very simple data center. We had, you know, everything hosted in one location. Back then, you know, we used to build out application servers and you'd say, okay, I, I'm going to 10x the amount of resources I'm going to plug into, 10x the memory, drives and all that. And then what happened is you, you started to see that there was only about maybe 5% utilization of the processor. So you wanted to be able to take advantage of all those digital hardware resources started plugging in VMs. So expanding out your environment through virtual machines. The cloud environment started to, to become ramping up over that, over that last decade period. And you started to seeing things with Amazon, at Azure, uh, Google Cloud Platform popping up. And you started to expand your, your application uh, landscape so that it now adds all these different components into it, but you still had to marry that to the back end. So you had cloud environments to, to deliver a very sleek and, and elegant front end tying into the back end for, you know, the legacy uh, application data from, you know, especially in uh, you know, high, high value uh, um, monetary figures and things along those lines that folks wanted to keep secure. So you got to marry the two together. And then as new developers are starting to work on these sleek and elegant applications, supporting all of those latest and greatest development tools and development languages has always been critical. So tying this all together, what you get is you get this very sleek, elegant application that the end user has. So they have, you know, the easy, you know, easy way. The great thing is retail. I got a retail example here. Look how easy it is to go and just pick up your phone and buy something quickly. 
that's the expectations you have so that when something fails and you have a, a problem with your application to the end user it's either on or off it's like as literal as a light switch you know it's, if it's not working they don't they don't understand the complexity that's going on in the background so finding that needle in the haystack has always been a a little bit of a challenge for us IT, I, uh, technologists to be able to rapidly respond to that you're in a position where by keeping that user experience top notch you want to be proactive and find out these problems before it really becomes an issue on your end user side and you always want to be able to tie that closely to the business you know the other piece too is around the overall uh, you know demand on it the business is heavily reliant on it so how do we make this work so app dynamics is an agent-based uh, system where we start to deploy lightweight agents throughout your application topology. So that's things that run on a Java virtual machine, .NET, uh, Node.js, and a whole plethora of other technologies that we support. And it gets deployed throughout your environment. And the cool thing is that once the agents are out there, it starts to automatically instrument and automatically configure what your topology looks like of your application uh, uh, flow. So now the, the cool thing is very easy to deploy. You know, Adam, do you have any color you can add there about deployment of AppD? I think you made a joke earlier to me that, you know, <laughs> you can install it, but maybe maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're spot on. And, um, it really is a testament to how simple it is. So um, when we first uh, started using AppD um, and we were trialing it out, I deployed it to one of our Node.js based apps. Um, and I think I managed to deploy it in, in pretty short order, uh, under an hour probably. And um, and I am by no means a developer, definitely not a Node.js developer. Um, so it really is extremely simple to deploy. Cool. So one of the first benefits you're gonna to start to see when you deploy App Dynamics is that we start to tag, trace, and follow every single user transaction that goes through. And that's as it hops along the entire flow map of, of where the app, app is touching. So whether it's going through a network, whether it's going through different containers through the cloud for the Kubernetes or Docker, public cloud, private cloud, databases, infrastructure, we follow that entire path. So what we give you is a consistent unit of measure of how you start to monitor and understand what your user experience is looking like. If you think about it from a, you know, a legacy mindset where we used to have silos and, and it, well, I mean, a lot of IT still does have silos, but you have silos built up where folks are monitoring the database, folks are monitoring the network, folks are monitoring the application, some are monitoring security, some are monitoring cloud uh, infrastructure. And the challenge is that when you'd have a problem pop up, everybody looks at their own individual silo and they start to say, well, my database is fine. I don't see a problem. So kick it over to somebody else. And then somebody looks at the network. Oh yeah, the network's fine. The problem is that the end user is still having a problem. So you want to have that consistent unit of measure that shows you everything that's going on. And when I started to look at AppDynamics prior to coming on board here, one of the cool things is I saw that flow map, that, that topology map of your application. This is always up to date, depend, regardless of what technology you start to add or remove from your application flow. So the cool thing here is that as you build it and deploy and instrument your app, and you may want to, you now want to maybe add in a different microservice to it. It's automatically instrumented, automatically discovered. So you see that. So you're always getting the update topology of the application. When you kind of build from there, the next thing we do is we start to baseline every metric. Now, when you look along the way of the, of the, of the flow, you may have a login, you may have go to, to a network, you go to a database, you go to, you know, however the flow is going to look, we automatically baseline every single metric. We're using a, a machine learning algorithm that allows us to understand what the normal activity of the application should look like any time of day, any day of the week, so that you're not getting these false alerts or, or, or IT alert storms, as we used to like to call them. I remember two, you know, 20 years ago when I rolled out uh, a monitoring platform, everybody told me to turn it off because the, uh, they just got their mailbox bombarded. So it was uh, you know, very you know, challenging for, for folks to, to you know, Accept the fact that you know, hey, this is uh, this is how you got to really fine tune things. So we, by by building in machine learning al algorithms to understand what that normal activity should look like, really helps you get a good understanding of baseline your application from a from an automatic mindset. But also understanding what the anomalies are going on in the application. So you may see because we can correlate the the business transactions to the application, 
understanding those anomalies that may be going on from a business point of view and alerting on that also, providing an automatic root cause analysis based on the data that we can, we can grab, it now has a very powerful way of, of, of seeing what's going on from your end user point of view and being very responsive to it. Now, one of the really interesting things that AppDynamics does is we were able to correlate the application to the business. And I find this extremely powerful. So if you think about the, the point of view of, you know, IT and, and, and the business really need to be interlocked together. And today they're, they're fairly separate. But interlocking the group together is, is a really key way of understanding how the IT technologists have the ability to influence the business and, and, and help the business drive their, their initiatives. Like I said before, the application is the business. So it's, it's something that you have to be very uh, forward thinking where you can then provide the business leaders some type of context of how the app is performing. So by us being able to follow that business transaction and understanding when somebody logs in, when somebody does a search for uh, through the catalog or when they start to add something to the cart, go through checkout and have that successful conversion, you wanna be able to track that in a way that a business leader can understand quickly and have that real-time insight of what that application is performing from a, from a dollars and cents or revenue point of view. When you kind of look at that, what can we provide? You know, having that piece that shows what's important to the business and show you that, you know, I have a, a, a high profile user logging into my site. This is what they want to do. I want to be able to have that, that real clear lens of, of what's happening. So by providing a dashboard, something like this, that that's very, um, compelling, very easy to use, and has many different use cases. One is to the business leader, I can see how many different unique people are coming into my application. How many people of them are segmented out as, as platinum or my top tier VIP customers? What's my overall conversion rate in my application? Now, this is really critical, especially when you're rolling out a DevOps or, de or biz DevOps environment where you wanna make these changes and you wanna get the investment from the business to be able to make, make the, uh, technology advances in your application by having the proof points to show that, look, this is what I've done and this is the results you got. You get that very strong interlock with the business leaders and then you get the continued investment to drive things forward. Um, and then from, a, from an overall um, view for the, for the, for the um, development teams and the IT teams too, you also have the ability of doing a side-by-side -side comparison of how my application performed before I provided an upgrade to after the upgrade. And this could be a, a multiple different scenarios. This could be simply upgrading the application. This could also be doing a complete uh, move to the cloud or lift and shift to the cloud and, and to be able to show that, that value to the, to the leaders of what's going on. So here you can see on the funnel, we show you the number of people that logged into the application at this particular spot and what the abandonment rate is off of that area too. So. When you get that kind of valuable insights and that data, the folks developing the application or the, or the DevOps leaders now have the ability to go in and say, okay, there's a high drop-off rate at this specific component of the application. Let me prioritize that so I can start refocusing on the development and the user experience there so that I don't get that drop-off rate and overall drive up my conversions. So you see that from a, from a DevOps point of view, but the, you know, the business leaders are gonna really care down at this bottom number. So pre-upgrade, I had about a four, four and three quarters percent conversion rate. After the upgrade, it went up to 14, almost 14 and a half. You see roughly a 300% increase on the conversion rates based on the upgrade or based on the migration to the cloud or diff, different environment. And this is the valuable context that you're, you're able to then bring to the table. Because like I said before, I mean, application is the business. And by having real-time analytical data like this, really helps you make those decisions and priority, pri uh, priorities set in the, the direction that you know, need to help drive that overall bottom line. So one thing, talk a little bit about the, you know, the evolution of how AppDynamics is, is advancing forward. So we, about a year, year and a, almost a year and a half ago, we've announced the st strategic vision between Cisco and AppDynamics called the central nervous system. So what we've done here is, you know, today, and typically you, you get the, the application data coming in through our agents that allow us to, to correlate the data together, provide you some alerting mechanisms, a dashboard, 
provide you some ability to do things from an automation point of view. So by automating your uh, creation of tickets, scaling some resources through one of the integrations we have with Cisco called Cisco CWAM, um, and allowing you know other things to be automated. Because the overall vision of, of where the market is going is, is about building out an AI ops platform. Building on AI apps, uh, or putting AI into your, your your technology, and that's about building, you know, full stack visibility, which is how we have this framed out here: visibility, insights, and action. We have full stack visibility, so we can open our platform, and start to ingest data from pretty much anywhere. So you have open source things like Prometheus and 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 other areas to be able to uh, take advantage of. Add in. Add in um, infrastructure uh, related metrics through something like an AWS CloudWatch network metrics, and then you know ultimately get into the security area where we can start to bring all this data together, correlate it, and give you the, the the real clear understanding of what is it normal to look like from an application point of view when you have multiple pieces of data coming through. Now the value there is that when you look at it from a couple things, one is you can have a unified view, you can have a unified dashboard. And then also you can start to um, understand when you have multiple metrics, you may have five or six different metrics coming through correlated together uh, from, you know, network infrastructure, you know, however you, however you have it uh, set up. And when one of them deviates and you have a correlation breakage, finding that pinpoint of where the root cause is becomes so much faster and so much easier. And that's what the, 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 the correlation engine in the center is, is designed to do so that you can start to correlate multiple metrics and then start to provide stronger action. So, you know, today you can do things where you can start to automatically open tickets, scale resources, things along those lines, but think about it, you know, as you start to build that uh, strategy and AI ops vision in your own environment where, you know, the best, the best case scenario, the, the nirvana that folks want to get to is around you know, we have uh, a war room get set up when there's an outage. You know, you have multiple people sitting in the war room and you may spend a couple of days fixing an issue. And then the next day, when you finally come back into the office, what do you guys got to do? You got to go through the postmortem. And, you know, by, by building a, a proper system or vision of how you build an AI ops platform, the one thing you want to think of is my Nirvana is going to be, I want something to automatically correct and send me what was done. So now I have my postmortem all done in an automatic fashion. So that's where you want to think of where the vision should go to, but we're giving you the platform or we're building on this vision from the last year and a half. Uh, like I mentioned jointly with, with Cisco, where we can start to open up our platform, allow you to do more with it and build that AA ops vision. Now we've also launched a partner program in conjunction with this strategy. And we've, we've gotten over 20 different partners to jump on board with us that, that see our vision and want to uh, participate with the, with us, and by building this out, and by um, you know having integrations with all different partner sets, something like you know Evolve and who provides change management, virtual instrument for instruments from an infrastructure management, you know, obviously from Cisco product sets like Cisco CWAM, ACI, UCCE from different product sets to tie that together, um, HashiCorp for scaling cloud resources. And you have, you know, folks on the action and response side. So the big, the big areas are, um, you know, folks like ServiceNow, uh, PagerDuty from the, the incident management point of view, Big Panda from scaling out resources as well. So this is a, a very robust platform. We're not looking to build a platform of, of thousands of partners. We want to make it very specific and solve specific challenges that we see in the market. So this is really ramping up quickly and, you know, you'll start to see this change as we, uh, start to um, evolve how we, how we move here. Now, a big question we always get is, you know, how do you start? How do you start thinking about, you know, APM and AI ops and, and, and driving that, that vision? So the, um, the first thing is about the understanding the vision and, and what is the purpose of digital transformation? It's really about providing that, that really keen, uh, clean um, customer experience. Now you think about that vision and you want to think about what's step two and you want to go from an outside in approach. So instead of thinking about your own internal IT, think about what the consumer is doing or think about what the business is doing um, from that perspective. Because like I said before, you really have to have that interlock between IT and business in order for companies to be able to transform and stay relevant in this, in this um, you know, uh, day and age with, with, with just the, the dependencies on digital applications, but the, the pandemic 
you know, obviously, you know, flip things upside down overnight and made it even more challenging. And then number three is about becoming a boardroom involvement. This is where the CIO needs to take the, the digital strategy transformation piece and make it a strategic part of the company. In this way, you have that as a, as a, as a key involvement of how the business is going to leverage technology to really drive the, the, the business challenges. Number four is around getting that data insights. So by having the real time data at, at your fingertips to be able to make these changes quickly is, um, you know, step number four, but it's, it's absolutely critical because if you think about, you know, the way you use your own applications, if things fail, you know, you may give it a free pass once, but if it starts failing regularly on you, you're going to start to change. You know, I, I, um, I, I see that many cases I've even changed banks because of my the bank I previously used, um, had some struggles with online bill payment and visibility. And, and now you even see the way that, um, you know, uh, things have changed on the banking front. They're also, I'm able to look at, log into my bank and see all the other different credit cards I have. So from a, from an insight point of view, you want to be able to have that valuable data coming in from your user experience and be able to make those changes quickly. And the last piece is attitude is everything. So you have a, a, a cultural shift in your company that would, would be going on. You have the right people with the right attitude to go in and drive transformation. And these people need to start to understand how to take risks. They need to make be able to experiment. They need to be able to balance that with the business so that they can start to take chances and start to drive the technology in the right place. But the real the real crux of it is without the proper tools, it makes it very difficult for somebody to go and take risks and, and experiment. So by putting that all together, you'll see how there's a you know five steps of of what needs to be brought into the picture of your your transformation strategy and starting from vision all the way to people. I don't know, Adam, do you have any um, commentary you want to add to that of what you see in the in the market? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I guess the one thing that um, I would maybe like to add to what you've kind of already gone through is is that I think there's maybe a it's a bit of a misconception um, that this kind of tooling is really only for um, maybe like e-commerce or, or organizations that um, deliver service directly to clients through an application um, and from our kind of personal experience of, of using this tool at Natilic because um, we do believe strongly in using the tools we promote um, we've we've definitely found that we've got extreme value from from using it not specifically in 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 our client facing applications but also in um, in our tooling and integrations that we've developed in-house and I think they're often often overlooked um, you know a lot of organizations us included uh, we use a lot of sort of large legacy apps like you know SaaS services such as 365 and and the likes, um, which hold a lot of our data. Um, and a lot of the development that we do in house is actually creating sort of microservices that integrate those platforms to allow the exchange of data. And it's quite easy to overlook those tools, um, yet they become like business critical applications effectively. Um, and we've had a lot of value by by integrating AppD into that tooling and into those uh, integrations. Um, not just from uh, understanding how they're performing, but also by being able to sort of extract transactional information to provide sort of business insights as that's that's where your data is flowing, right? So um, yeah, that's probably the one thing I would add is just that it, it isn't just for those kind of e-commerce organizations and those, those companies yeah. that transact specifically through apps. You know, you know it's funny, it's, uh, I, I always, every company is a technology company nowadays. And uh, it, somebody had mentioned to me uh, about a month and month and a half ago that the space shuttle back when the space shuttle was still in flight that current tractors farm tractors have more technology in them more lines of code in them than the original space shuttle so that's that, like that's very eye opening when you kind of think about it from that perspective so it's it's um you know inter interesting paradigm shall we say so with that i'd like to wrap it off a couple uh you know uh, leaving thoughts here is one is, you know, visibility and insights are the key to make the decisions. So you really need to be able to see what's going on before you can actually start to, to, to drive and, and make changes in your, in your, um, your strategies. So by having that visibility and then having an engine in the center that can give you those insights real time um, and even alert you based on things before they get out of control is really critical to get you moving forward in any digital transformation space. And I'd like to also tell everybody, stay safe 
you know, this is uh, challenging times we're all living through. And um, you know, I wish everybody health and uh, a very uh, successful rest of the year. But I'd like to pass it over to Adam to close us out. Thanks, Greg. Um, and thank you for coming today. It's been brilliant. Um, I guess if we just turn over to the participants briefly and see if there's any questions anyone would like to field. Um, we have a Q&A section in the WebEx. So if you'd like to pop anything up, we'll, uh, we'll keep it open for a few minutes and, uh, and answer anything you might have. Okay, uh, so first question that's come in is, uh, how quickly can a customer see value from this solution? Well, the, uh, the value is seen in, in a couple different stages. And, and the way I see it first is the, the value that you're gonna see with the flow map to me just blew me away. Now that's gonna be the first thing you see is, is that topology of your application. Within a couple hours, you're gonna start to see metrics uh, baselining set because now your application usage is happening. So you're going to see value very, very quickly from App Dynamics, where where you can then start to understand what's going on. I've had scenarios where customers bring us in because they're having a problematic application, and and you know the 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 console lights up like a Christmas tree because there's so many different red and green lights going off, and um, they saw value immediately, and they were just so impressed on how quickly they were able to get to root cause. So the um, the uh, I can't give you an exact specific hour or time, but it's going to be very fast on how quickly you see value from from implementing App Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, and that definitely mirrors our experience of the product as well. Um, it was extremely easy to, to deploy, and as soon as we deployed it, you know, it was immediately feeding data back to us that was as useful and meaningful. Uh, I think that's it. Unless anyone else has any more questions, you can feel free to answer or feel free to ask. There's, uh, there's, there's no wrong questions. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we'll give them a few more seconds. And, uh, and if there's no more questions, we'll, uh, we'll end it there. Uh, okay, that's a good one. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, there was a question that came through. Is there a trial of the product to help prove value to our internal customers? So the, I'll give you a, a quick um, overview of how our uh, process works is we actually do a proof of value with our customers and, and we'll work with, um, with Adam and crew to, to help you do that. But we actually instrument uh, one or two applications and then get you up and running so that you can see that value internally. Uh, we call it a proof of value. And we do also have um, licenses available for uh, the COVID-19 response for a, a trial period till, till uh, July 15th. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, there is one more question that's come in that um, I think is actually uh, quite pertinent. So um, the question was specifically, how do you support Kubernetes? And I think that's a great question because that must be on the top of you know any yeah, it's a very, 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 very hot, very, very hot topic. So we have a cluster agent for Kubernetes that you deploy per cluster, and we're able to see, you know, as a containers pop up and close, we're able to, you know, flex with that. Um, we have a very, it's a very um, a robust approach that we have for um, for supporting Kubernetes. So that's that's involved right in the product set. Um, it's just by deploying the Kubernetes agent. And I guess um, just literally as the nature of that integration would mean it would also be compatible with any other sort of PaaS platform. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, I think that's it. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, so probably let everyone uh, let everyone get a bit of time back. But uh, thank you very much for attending today. It's been brilliant. And uh, we maybe look forward to having you back at some point.